time, I'm sorry. I talked previously about the introduction to structures in, in 3D comparisons, and today what I want to talk about is alignments. So science is communication. Communication always begins with questions. Are there questions for the slide so far? Anything that came up to you? Why do we compare shapes? So what we want to get at ultimately is to find out whether two proteins have similar function. Why do we compare shapes at all? Last lecture I talked about comparing 3D structures. Why would we do that if we could compare function? So you, your perspective may rightfully be uh, it's nonsense. Uh, does anybody sort of put that argument up? We should compare function directly? Nobody. Nobody has an idea why we compare 3D structures. Often, in fact, uh, it begins with the first statement, because we can. <coughs> we can compare three-dimensional objects because it's very simple. Function is not defined on a metric. Function has to do where a protein is, what it does, what it interacts with, in which process it is, what molecular function it has. All of these are different aspects, and we cannot compare them simultaneously. There's no simple objective function, a simple criteria that we can put into a number. Function is one number. Hold on, do you guys know function is one number? Have you ever heard about such a thing as function as a number? You guys are cheating. You were in the, first, in the second course first. <laughs> um, the others. You don't know about a function is one number? Have you ever heard about some aspect of protein function that is given in a number? Anybody who was not in the last lecture? Have you heard about the enzyme the EC numbers? Enzyme nomenclature or enzyme commission numbers? So e enzymes are classified by four digits. And each of these numbers give the entire enzymatic activity or the entire role of the enzymatic function. So for enzymes, we have something that is one number. Have you guys heard of the gene ontology? GEO. Gene ontology is the attempt. Ontology means simply put a number into the meaning function. The problem with that one is gene ontology has three ontologies. There is no one. There are three different ontologies. There's one ontology for the compartment, where the protein is in a cell. There's one ontology for the molecular function. That would be the enzyme the enzymatic function, the molecular function, so in detail how the function is done. And one is for the process it is involved in. So if you want to compare two proteins by the function, you already have to compare them on three different numbers on this. Structure is only one simple number, right? And that is already one answer to this question here, because it's simpler to compare shapes, okay? But there's more to it. Before we get into this more to it, there is one problem in the comparison of sequences that is prevalent throughout this lecture and the next one too. Uh, it goes back to here, there's the COPS metric. And ultimately, if we say, if we had some criterion by which we can say that protein A is similar to protein B. And we had another or a similar criterion by which we then can say that protein B is similar to protein C. That does not imply that protein C is similar to A. Okay? So the problem or the way we typically describe similar to is not transitive. The triangle inequality is not hold. Uh, and this simply could be because what we compare here between A and B is a different region than what we compare between B and C. And in fact, B, A, A, C and A have no region in common in this example. In 3D, it would look like this. So we could compare C and B here, and we could compare A and B. We would find something similar between A and C. There's no similarity. This is a reality of most comparisons in the protein world that we have. How could you try this? Of course, this is a problem when you compare, when you write down rules, A is similar to B, and then you want to infer in multiple alignments in families, infer something about function. If the transitivity problem is, maybe the thing about the statement about function is exactly based on something that is not similar. 
Maybe the similarity of function is based on this one and simply because these two align and in the database you have this one you may, may say, uh, well, let's do it differently. This one you know binds DNA, the stretch here. So you put by homology this annotation into that protein, you say B binds DNA, I've measured it for C, and I know that B and C are similar enough, so I assume that B in fact also binds DNA. And then you see that actually A and B are similar. So now you say, okay, A binds DNA. And you immediately see this becomes wrong, right? Because the DNA binding is on a different side. How could you address this issue? How could you avoid this mistake? Yeah? You just compare domains. So you could hope that you could actually cut the protein here into the regions that make up the important part for function and cut it into domains. That had, there are two problems with that approach. One is the domain is not easily known. And secondly, DNA binding in this particular case, this really is not a domain. This is one domain, this is one domain protein. It's a region, it's something smaller than a domain here. So Pia could then say, okay, we can cut it into more. In, into, into fragments of domains, namely into the fragments of domains that are associated, for instance, in this particular case with DNA binding, so with function. We could try that, but it's even more compelling. Another way of doing that is, in some sense you may, may call it hack. It's a solution that comes from Manfred Zippel. Uh, I'll show a follow of him on the next slide. Uh, his idea simply is, you compile the similarity not based on the fragment that aligns, but you buy, compile it based on the entire thing. So based on the entire thing in this language that would mean that essentially, I'm just speaking sort of uh, in images here, this matches only to one half. So the optimal match you can get with this short thing is one half. And the optimal match with that thing is also one half. So each of those would only match to one half. Uh, so it would not be a complete match, and from not a complete match you can then compile something that behaves like what is it called a metric. A metric is a mathematical construct that has the feature that in fact if A is similar to B and B is similar to C, then A is similar to C. And this is simply by expanding the comparison, right? You can ascertain that. And so this is my principle here, put that into a method that is used for the 3D classification of proteins, COPS. Another statement that I made is that the information three is, that is in a three-dimensional structure can be condensed in sort of one dimension onto 2D without losing important information. So the 2D representation and the 2D is a distance map. So in this 2D map what you have here is you write every single residue in your protein, here it happens to be 99, every residue of the protein again, and each one of these here, the darker, the closer these pairs of residues. So the first residue is closest to the second. Well, sort of trivial, right? Uh, it has some proximity to the third and so forth and so on. And then there is something that is a little bit close here. Uh, and if you take the 3D coordinates and you put them into this distance map, then you contain, to retain, retain the entire information in the sense that from this one here, you could reproduce the 3D structure. There's some issue about the mirror image you cannot reproduce. But other than that, you can reproduce the 3D structure. Uh, that means that essentially the information contained in the 3D is also in 2D. When we go back here to 1D, or when we go one dimension less into 1D, we go in strings, in strings of sequence, in strings of secondary structure, in strings of solvent accessibility, for instance. These are strings. These lose information. From these strings, I cannot get to back to 3D structure. So again, in some sense, the, the content of this course is the question, can we take sequences and predict 3D structures? Because in principle, if you understood the physics of the problem well enough, I should be able to go from this 1D sequence into 3D structure. In some sense then, 1D sequence plus understanding of protein folding is analogous to having the full 3D information, right? But we actually cannot do that. Uh, so what I will show you over the course of this lecture, over the course of the next two or three lectures, is that we can best do that by something that is called comparative modeling, where we do sequence comparisons, 1D comparisons, and find proteins for which the 3D structure is known, that is similar to a protein for which the 3D structure is not known, and the one for which I do not know the 3D structure, I can infer it.
simply from the 1D alignment. Okay? But essentially what I do is I look up known 3D information. That is one way in which I can predict 3D structure. And in fact, this is the most successful way in terms of numbers. It's most accurate and it's the one that applies for most protein predictions. Then what we can do is for some proteins we can predict something that looks similar to these contact maps and can then actually predict the 3D structure. Now some is a small number here. Some in this particular case is for, uh, we can do that currently for about 50 families in human. Human have 20,000 proteins. Again, it depends a little bit on how, how you count the families, but ballpark 3,000 families, 4,000 families. For 50, we can do it. But for most of them, for the bulk, we cannot. For the bulk, all we can do is predict strings in 1D, such as secondary structure, solvent accessibility, membrane regions, disorder, and this is what we're going to talk about in this, in this lecture mostly. Okay, but let's begin with the sequence comparison. Alignment methods essentially answer the question how similar are proteins. Here are two words that are not proteins, so the letter O doesn't exist in the protein universe. And with these, but with these I can easily introduce this, this uh, objective. You, the objective is to sort of optimize match, in this particular case match is identity of a letter. Uh, and you can visually immediately find the optimal match for these two strings. You put a new string, you can again find where that belongs. And now that you put the new one in, you find we are much faster in trying all possible variants because you immediately see where it fits best with the two and then you try around that and this speeds it up and you have more then you get an alignment and the alignment the idea behind this alignment is again that they all have something similar they have a similar function because somehow what you believe here is that that you reflect an origin a common origin this one is father uh, in, in some language, right? Uh, and this is not father. Uh, these here are in three different languages, grandfather. And you begin to sort of appreciate the problem. Uh, we have a simple criterion here that we optimize. We optimize identity of letters. In words, it's the same as in proteins. We believe that there is some relation between the words in three different languages. Grandfather looks somehow similar, although it's not the identical word, because there is a commonality in the origin of the language. Just like in proteins, right? And we did sort of simply do the optimal superposition here. And what you can see is that sometimes it goes wrong. So here you could still argue, well, it went wrong because I had to have a threshold. And I didn't put the threshold at the right position. So maybe I need, need more matches, three and four, or something like that. Or the IE should never match, or, or, or some, some other criterion that you can imagine that would exclude this last one here. But it's much, we will immediately see, it's much more difficult to see why this one here fits, fits right in the middle and has a different meaning. Now, you may argue that sort of in the etymology of the meaning of the word father and grandfather is sort of related, but it's not, right? There's a, uh, there's a substantial difference um, between these two. And we cannot see that substantial difference from just looking at the alignment. And this is exactly the problem we have in biology. We optimize the similarity that we see on the level of the word, and we infer a meaning from that. And all we can do in order to avoid that the, this word sort of is not, is not aligning under and that this one is not falling out, is trying to use the best criterion for the match. So what could we change in this game here? To make sure that this one falls out and that this one maybe is underneath and that the three grandfathers are together. How could I sort of in, in, in yeah? Clustering? In clustering, yes, but in clustering what you mean is, you, the simplest way would be, uh, I put the meaning grandfather so I cluster them together. But this is, you are then doing it by bringing in your knowledge, right? This in fact is very often done. It's true. Uh, so is it, uh, many families, often families are built up exactly by that. You bring in your expertise about something that you know and you put the cluster on it. What I'm asking asking now is how could you make the algorithm do that internally without your knowledge? How could you make the algorithm discover what you as an expert may know? Yeah? Try it Martin. Uh, 
order them by similarity? Yes, but this is what I sort of see. What I'm trying to say is that is what I did. Uh, maybe I didn't. Didn't? Yeah. No, I didn't actually. <laughs> okay, I'm cheating. No, it's, uh, but wait, 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 wait. So the highest match is still these two. And the first one as well. So if they are So this one goes out. Okay, this, so this one, okay, I have to change my example. So this one has to go out because only two, these two, these three are both three matches. So you can still not distinguish the, this one from that one. And this one is the right, so we could still not do the clustering, right? I mean, randomly you could say, okay, there, there are three, so you would still cluster the, the one with the father into two grandfathers. So it would still not solve the problem. So my question is, how can I possibly change the algorithm, or what can I do in the algorithm, without putting in additional knowledge uh, to make the clustering automatically find that? Mm. Yeah? It defines pattern like there has to be an Ah. And afterwards, an A, so this uh, last one. You're right, Louisa. But then again, you sort of you bring that in by bringing in the knowledge for that you know what grandfather is, right? And then by knowing that what is grandfather, this is exactly you begin by, by, by the, you group the ones that are grandfather, and then you say, since I know this is grandfather, I know they have something in common, the pattern that I see in those is what I call the motif that I have to match, right? And this is exactly, again, the, a lot of databases. Uh, this is uh, ProSight is one of the databases that is done exactly that way. Uh, where, well, ProSight doesn't use grandfather, uh, it uses protein motifs. But essentially it's the same idea, it's exactly that idea. Uh, my question now is what could I possibly try to put into an algorithm so that it would itself find that? In this particular example, I, I admit my example is not chosen very well. Uh, guys, give me a break. I mean, I. <laughs> have three grandfathers already, so this, <laughs> this is already an achievement, right? Uh, so there's some limit to, to what I can do with my simple examples. But so the examples are optimal. What I wanted to, do, to ask you is, how can I change the algorithm such that maybe, 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 the new way of clustering would find the right cluster, the new way of method would find the right clustering? By exactly what you suggest, Martin, yeah? No, anybody? Yeah? Uh, computer consensus sequence and then compare as. But in this particular case, still is a pup, right? Yeah. So the consensus would not do it. No, so what, yeah? If you penalty the repeat, like papa and pp, that's some repeats. <laughs> oh, that's a great idea. <laughs> but, but then, this is a great idea. This is a great idea. Uh, the problem, uh, so this is clearly the limitation. It's a, good, it's a great idea. Uh, it's the limitation of uh, my, 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 little, my little example. Because when you look at a 100 residue, you will have motifs, right? You will have repetitions. Since we have only 20 amino acids, we have 100 residues. You have to use some more often than once. Um, so that, that is, is really, since I, in, in four that I have the same one again, it's, it's more uh, surprising in some sense. But yeah, that would be one idea. Mm. It's a great idea, Nabil, because in fact, I'm not aware of an alignment method that is doing that. But one could actually try something like that. Uh, implicitly it's done, but not explicitly. So this is an interesting idea. Uh, I would have to talk to somebody about that. <laughs> There's something interesting behind it. Uh, what I wanted to get at is actually ultimately similar. What you could try to see is whether changing your criterion of what is optimal. In this particular case, we called the optimization was done to optimize the identity of the letter, the A's and the P's, or the, whatever letter you have. You, a P matching a P is giving you a one. And a P not matching a P is giving you a zero, right? You could possibly try to see whether a different way of alphabet is such that it would in fact cluster the things right. Maybe in, in language it's really true that some 
maybe some of you can't remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of you are speaking Spanish. Uh, so the V and the B is is is, is something. So if, if if a language cannot distinguish between two written letters in the way they are pronounced, then it's very likely that in, in the way words evolve from different languages, for these two different letters is not so important, either of those two, because the language in the way they pronounce cannot distinguish, right? This is one way in, in which we can in language clearly see that. Um, and in proteins we will get back uh, to, to the same idea. Now, the first issue here really is what is right, and right is defined by the objective function. The simplest objective function we had it is we match the percentage of letters or the number of letters. Uh, and then there are sort of more complicated ways to, to define a match. Uh, but ultimately, all of this, whatever we look at on the sequence level, ignores where we are going with this. Where we are going, where we are aiming at, so we want to match structures, we want to match function, we want to match some evolutionary relations. Uh, but for the time being, let's ignore that this is what we want. Let's just see how far can we go with a string matching problem. So we just have words. And in just comparing words, again, there's another issue. Uh, there's a difference between a global and a local best match. A global best match essentially means that if I align two proteins, I align them and I match both ends. So I take one to the end and the second, and I have at least the ends match. The G and the E matches and the uh, P and L are uh, close to match. While in the other case, we can sort of have internal, uh, we can have sub-matches. So in most extreme case, we could just call this one here the alignment, the G and Q. That would be a very, very local alignment. You would have only two residues match, right? Uh, and there is always going to be a problem. Uh, what is better, the, the, the local or the global? Um, and I'm going to... I'm going to uh, fast forward over a couple of these things here. Uh, what is homology? You guys all studied biology. Do you know what homology is? And I actually go into phylogeny, uh, so let me fast forward through, through Darwin and go back into homology. Uh, so ultimately, the agreeing of words. So ultimately, where it comes from is from large species. And it goes back to Darwin. It, or in this particular case, goes back to Richard Owen, uh, who first introduced this idea of homology, homolog homologous organs. There are organs in the whale, that, because the whale is a mammal that went into the ocean, and it was a four-footed, uh, four-legged animal, or is, is, essentially is a four-legged animal, uh, but the legs have a different role in the whale. Then most whales are not walking around on the, on the, in the ocean. So the feet, uh, legs adopt a new meaning, right? And the homology really is the analogous part of an organ or of a body in an organism. Uh, and this is today what we really talk about typically when we talk about homologs is the analogous gene, the analogous protein. We just have to be aware that originally this term means something else. It is typically applied on the level of an organism. And for the individual gene, but still the idea really is that what we have underneath is some common ancestral idea. And that gets us back to uh, the, the idea of speciation, the speciation event. Uh, so ultimately, what is defining a species? Do you, does anybody in the room remember what, how biologists define a species? Or the difference between two species? Yeah? Um, that they um, can't breed, like the different species can't have offspring. That's the crucial point. Uh, they, they can't have offspring, right? Uh, and the way we imagine that this sort of happens, that two species can't have offsprings, is, is, a, is a process somehow. Uh, so we, we, we begin with a, with a mixture of species. We still have some that sort of have some different preferences. So some like banana, right? And they're enjoying banana. And then, you know, some disaster struck. So there is a river, and the river sort of separates these two types of species. Uh, and some are happy eating their banana. The river comes, and then the other part of their friends is sitting on the other part of the island. Uh, and now, over time, 
these two groups that originally that are from one species just by adopting different preferences because they are slightly different environments they are such that if one day then the banana with the flies comes to the other island or the other part of the river uh, they no longer can have offsprings that's somehow how we imagine uh, the speciation event uh, by the way okay not for flies C -c can you think about any any organism or any any animal in fact what I'm talking about is a mammal uh, for which there was a river that sort of split to to a group that became two different species today we have two before the river we had only one apes a particular type of ape any idea about what I mean chimps and bono Chimpanzee and, uh, and the Bono are two, I, I don't know, uh, so Bono is a, essentially, if, if you don't know what a Bono is, is Bonobo is, is essentially is a, is a smaller chimpanzee. But we assume that they were one uh, species before the Kenya River happened. Uh, and that really split these two species. And not only can they no longer easily mate, uh, but they really have very, very different behavior. To, to begin with one thing, one is patriarchal and one is matriarchal. So uh, this is completely different social behaviors of, of these two groups. Um, anyway, now this is the, the speciation events. We, we have the definition of the species. And then ultimately the way it is in biology, the detail is always a little bit more complicated, whether these are different species or not. There, there are always exceptions to this. Uh, and well, <laughs> Does anybody in the room know an exception to, the, to this issue with a speciation? Uh, cannot have uh, offspring? The ligands that exist? Yeah. The yeah. Yes, yes, but something that's closer in the room. Closer to us. And I, I'm not entirely talking about some, some microbiopes that are sitting here. We. What do I mean? Any idea? Yeah. I think there was uh, breeding between humans and the other plants. We all, everybody in this room carries Neanderthal genes between ballpark 2%, 2 to 4%, 4% okay? Uh, and that right there is the end of this idea, right? Uh, so the offspring survived and we carried the, we all, everybody in this room carries the, uh, the Neanderthal. Okay. Um, Again, it's slight misuse when we talk about homology and structure, homology and function is all a little bit misleading. I made you aware of this term and I'm going to happily from here on violate that and, and, and sort of uh, happily do make this mistake. Uh, but again, it's often misused and we have to be careful. But it reminds us of the connection in evolu evolution, uh, this typo. Uh, okay, so we want to align proteins have the evolutionary to find the evolutionary relation to find the similarity in uh, structure and sequence uh, in function and ultimately because we can and because in fact measuring 3d similarities and 1d similarities is simpler okay let's get back to how do we align we align by dynamic programming dynamic programming is the simplest solution totally brute force if you want to so visually align these two sequences with one another you begin by simply trying all possibilities and this way, this is exactly what you visually did when I showed you Papa and Papi. You simply immediately in your head compared all possible solutions. That's very easy with, a, with four. Uh, it's still possible with these here. Uh, these strings are still not, not so long. And the formalization of this is the algorithm from, published by Needleman and Wunsch in 1970 in the Norm of Molecular Biology. And ultimately, the idea behind the algorithm is you write one sequence, the other sequence, and you begin by, so first of all, what I'm going to enter here, one means match, match is identity of letter, zero or empty, color, uh, empty parts mean no match. So the first thing to populate in this matrix here is the ones, so the matches. Let's begin with the E here, there are the other E's, the G, the other blah blah blah. You see all the possible benches. Now the next thing is we have to actually align strings. 
If we have to align strings, we have to go on a diagonal. So we begin by matching, for instance, the letter G against this G. The next step we do, of course, is we have to match here the next one, G, against the Q, and so forth and so on. Right? This is ultimately exactly what we do here. What I put in by doing the G against the Q and the Q against the P, bless you, my overall score is still 1. So I'm now summing up the score because I'm not adding any identity. So no matter how far I go, it will always be 1 in this particular case because there, there, there is no more. And that's, that's what this matrix here shows. In this particular case, you get to 2. Uh, but ultimately, that's it. You can't get higher than 2. How could you get higher than 2? Using uh, Blossom or Palm matrix? Yes, but how can you get higher than 2 not using Blossom or Block? Just, uh, just on identity matching. Um, maybe introducing gaps? By introducing gaps, yes. So uh, with no gaps, this is sort of the best you can do. Uh, and with gaps, this is one much is a much better solution. A gap on this language here is, oops, I missed a slide. So on, on this, in this language, a gap is you uh, allowed to move to the right. So down or right. So down would essentially be cutting. Of, it's sort of a symmetric problem, right? Down is cutting in that one. In that direction is uh, putting in a gap. Uh, it's a symmetric problem. And this way you can get, for instance, here to four. Uh, and this way you define paths through this matrix and you find an optimal path and you can look at suboptimal paths and that is what this figure shows here a so called dot plot uh, for one particular relatively long uh, protein and looking for its self similarity so aligning the, the one protein against itself and finding fragments in that protein that are self similar and you see that there is one best path here and then there are sort of suboptimal paths, but there is no suboptimal path that is very black. So most suboptimal paths are local regions. And the one that is the diagonal, of course, is the, the self alignment. It's the identical sequence match. So this is sort of a trivial one. But from these ones, you immediately see that there are some regions here. There's some sort of repetition. Uh, and there's something here. There, there's some sort of repetition motifs here. Uh, so these dot plots can tell you a lot about sequences. OK, so ultimately, if you have a gap, for the gap, you pay a price. You add a gap to the alignment, so you win by, by matching identical letters, and you lose by introducing a gap. And by this simple rule, these two ways of looking at it, here I have five gaps, and here I have five gaps, is the same loss, right? in terms of the formula. It's the same, you get, you get the same loss. But I already sort of, without even looking into the room, I already sense that there's unhappiness in this room. Uh, mathematically, what I said is correct. Uh, but your unhappiness is highly, highly welcome. Uh, because when we look at proteins, then what we very often see is something such as this one. So that's protein 1, 2, and uh, And you see that there are regions where they all have no gaps. And there are regions then where we have very long gaps. So the idea that we have five gaps in a row is much more reflecting this image than the idea that we have a match, gap, match, gap, match, gap. Right? That's not what we see. Uh, how could we, in the language of the, the gap, where essentially I'm going to, uh, Smith Waterman or the Needleman Wunsch, ultimately the, the, gap, the gap alignment is called uh, Smith Waterman, ultimately, or this, uh, the, the, the gap, the local alignment is a Smith Waterman alignment. So in this local Smith Waterman score, we have here the identity match, and then we subtract the gap, the number of gaps times the cost for the gap. Now, my question is, how could I make it such, how could I change this formula such that I see more consecutive gaps and fewer match gap, match gap kind of situations? How can I change that? In this function. It's too trivial, yeah? Uh, the gap extension, so. So you have two types of gaps, exactly. You have a gap open, 
and you have a gap extension. Uh, technically, this is referred to as the fine gap penalty, where the the gap open penalty is a different price than the gap extension. The gap open is much more expensive. So opening a gap costs you much more than extending it. Meaning <coughs> you can not, so you, the, you have to have a win a lot of matches in order to open a gap. But once it's open, it's relatively, you don't need that many matches at the end of the day to extend it. Okay? And this is one particular way in which typically people do that. So the gap open is 10 times the gap extension. Uh, but there are different ways of doing that. Uh, so with that, again, we now uh, the optimal alignment, we have an optimal alignment and if it's a local alignment then ultimately what I write down here this is mathematically exactly what you said uh, the Smith-Waterman uh, extension of this here published in JMB in 81 and ultimately many 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 methods that are used today still are based almost all alignment methods somehow are still based on on this original paper from, from Temple Smith and Michael Waterman now, what is best, local or global? So again, the, the local alignment would be to sort of cut somewhere here. The global alignment would be to enforce uh, the whole thing. That brings up another question. Is it really the total number of matches that is best? Uh, proteins have 60 to 400 residues. So, what do you believe at the end of the day? Will it be sort of local matches? Will it be global? Well, domains, proteins are made up of domains. So you need to allow for local, right? And that's very clear. The next question, however, is not so clear. The next question is here, if I had this local, G and Q, I would have an alignment of two. And in this alignment of two, I have 100% matches. If I took the longer alignment here, I would get to an alignment where 4 and 7 are right. So what is better? 2 and 2 or 4 and 7? So obviously you cannot easily answer that. What would you have to do in order to find out? How could you find out what is better? Let's begin really with these two and two. I have two letters that are matching. Is that meaningful? How can you tell me that it's meaningful or not? Okay, let's, let's rephrase this. This is nonsense. How can you find out that it's nonsense? Every one of you can easily find that out in less than five minutes. All you need to do is take a string of GQ or any other pair and search in 111 million sequences in Uniprot. And you will find so many matches that you immediately realize this is a random hit. Okay? Two, the database is way too big. Two you would get by sequencing mistakes or by, by with, the, with the current size of the sequence, two is not meaningful. Okay? So, in this particular example, as I put it on the whiteboard here, the answer is very simple. Two is wrong. Whether four and seven, or seven is long enough to not get spurious hits, this would require a little bit more work. So, sort of grabbing, the, so finding this in 111 million is, is already not possible because you cannot just do a grab. Here, here you can do a grab. Uh, here you, in fact, have to run an alignment method. It's still relatively fast, it's still not really an issue, but here you have to do much more work uh, to, <coughs> to see how often you get that a chance. But it, it leads over to the next question. But, but the important point here is the way you test it is by looking again at matches in the database. So how likely do you get a match such as this or that from the database? The refinement of that would be you have a labeled data set. So you have labels, for instance, you have pairs of proteins for which you know they are similar in functional structure. And then you see which of these two kind of, if you have an alternative between local or uh, 10 residues or 20 residues, and you ask whether you match that in known pairs that are similar. That brings us to the next question. Is identity 
the best measure. And Tatiana already said no, there is a blossom matrix and that is three steps ahead. Uh, so before we get into that, here's a much simpler way of addressing this. The much simpler way of addressing well, is actually not simple at all. Uh, but what I show here are two different species, potassium channels for two different species. I highlight in this one three positions. The three positions that are highlighted are the selection point of the potassium channel. In both cases, those three residues are relevant for letting only potassium through. What you observe when you look in detail, or you may, may be able to see that, is here we have an A on an I, here an I on an L, and here is an E on E. So only in one of the three, the most essential part of the function of this potassium channel is identical. This slide here was done by Marco Punta, but the, uh, the, the matching of these two, so the group of McKinnon uh, at Rutgers Univer uh, Rockefeller University realized from this alignment here that these two proteins are similar, that they are both potassium channels, and they, through that they found out that they could actually uh, uh, do the structure of this one, and that, went to, uh, that led ultimately to a Nobel Prize. And it began with the, with the insight of seeing this alignment and seeing in this alignment that in fact these two proteins do the same thing. And that these are the crucial parts of the, the select, selecting filter of the potassium channel. And it's not trivial, but it's impossible as long as we use identity. Okay, if we compare these two. Uh, we clearly need to get into something else. So the first attempt at something else was done by Margaret Dehoff uh, the PAM matrices, the point accepted mutation matrices as a substitution matrix. And Margaret Dayoff then, in fact, had uh, about 1500, then is 1978, uh, 1572 uh, observed mutations in a bunch of 71 uh, families of proteins. A relatively small data set, and she tried to look at all of the variants and simply answer to the question what is a change that is evolutionarily accepted as to opposed to one that is not. Ultimately, what this is about is trying to understand the biochemical features or biophysical features. So, if you have two hydrophobic residues that are not an L on an I, you can match because they both have a similar feature although the letter identity is not the same, but aligning an L to a tryptophan that has very different features, or to a lysine that has, is a charged, positively charged residue, that may be not a good idea. So the underlying idea is by comparing existing sequence protein families, we sort of have, a, have a, an extraction of these biophysical rules. Uh, and she can carve that into a substitution matrix, the PUM, where PUM1 is one point mutation per 100 uh, comparisons. Uh, PUM matrices are still heavily used uh, by people who do sort of evolutionary m m motivated comparison of, of proteins. They are not used by people who use protein sequence, uh, protein structure comparison or protein function, or try to infer protein structure or function. Uh, so for most but the Wikipedia is not reflecting that truth. Um, okay, so here, here is another way of doing that. It's not another, it's, it's just uh, it's the same idea a few years later, from I only show Stephen Hennikoff because from Hocha, I just could not find any photo, and the ones I had I lost. Um, so Stephen and uh, Hocha, Hocha is the mathematician in the in the family, uh, so she is the one who did the math underneath, uh, and Stephen is the biologist in this in this game, or the uh, experimental biologist, as you can see here as a proof. Uh, but on that, on that note, uh, Stephen Hennikoff, uh, introns, who invented introns, who, who sort of discovered introns, Stephen. So there, there's a lot about Stephen Hennikoff. Uh, and a lot of the 
acetylation signals. So there's, there's a variety of things that, that Stephen introduced into the field. Uh, this is, is just one of those things with which he influenced computational biology. The Blossom matrix. The idea behind the Blossom matrix is you have a bunch of protein pairs for which you assume that they have a similar function. Okay? And if they have similar function, you compare these amino acids and you simply say what you see in terms of substitution is exactly what evolution accepts, meaning that this reflects biophysical rules. Okay? That means you, all you need to do is, from the observations of the bunch of pairs, compile the log odds, create an exchange matrix, the so-called blossom matrix, shown here, where you have the 20 amino acids, 20 amino acids, and one particular point here, the E against the E, gives you four, four points, while the A against the A gives you only two. And that's the first observation here. The diagonal, so previously uh, in the identity match, the diagonal is one and everything else is zero. Here, the diagonal elements are not all equal. Okay, that's the first observation. Uh, the tryptophan here, in fact, not only that, there's a, is an immense scale difference here between alanine on alanine two and tryptophan on tryptophan 17. So one tryptophan gives you as much as six alanines. Uh, okay, so that's one reality. The other reality is there are minus values here. So again, that is, I'm not, I'm, I'm only glossing over what uh, dynamic programming is. Uh, there's a lot more underneath, so the, the average over this matrix should be slightly negative, so that's why there are negative elements. In principle, you could scale it such that the lowest is a zero, so everything is positive, right? You could scale it any way the log odds. Just have to have a scaling factor in there. Uh, but ultimately, so the way, the, in, in order to make it work, for best for the dynamic programming, some mismatches have to sort of reduce the, the score you get. There are some things you should avoid. It's as simple as that. So here's a minus one. Uh, and you see that some of these minus values are much higher. So the highest is a minus eight, I believe. But I can't see it at the moment. Here, the tryptophan on a, on a system. Uh, maybe there, there is some other number. But uh, so then the, the sort of neutral ones, the zeros, they're very positive ones. And uh, sometimes, the, I said that already, the non match score of, uh, I said that here, right? Uh, in some cases, the non, no, I didn't say. In some cases, the non match score can be higher or as high as a, as a match score. Uh, let me find an example for that. Uh, three, here we have one. The R and the K, so we have two positively charged residues. It's K and R is a mismatch in, in terms of letter identity, but here we get a three, again, they're both positively charged, and this is more than alanine on alanine, for instance, okay? Um, good, there are many, many, many more uh, substitution matrices today, and typically the different matrices are used for different purposes. Uh, but most of the time, we use something that is relatively similar to, to Blossom 62 and has been derived using the same algorithm that I describe here, or the same idea that I describe here. By the way, there is a nice interactive software tool uh, that was published by Francesco Melo to play a little bit with the impact of dynamic programming. Okay, dynamic programming is optimal, but there is a problem. Uh, the problem here is the time used. It's the order of the length times two. So it's L times L. So the length of the two proteins, or the square of the length. Okay, square of the length. Proteins are on the average 400 residues long. Why is that? A, why, 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 why should I worry about 400 times 400? If it's in miles and I have to walk it, that's a big number, yes. But uh, if it's a number of steps I'd have to do in a computer, it's nothing. So why do I care? The answer is trivial. So if you don't say it because it's too trivial, think again and say it. <laughs> no, say again, <laughs> whatever. No, it's not trivial. No. So ultimately, the answer is because you're not comparing two proteins. You 
typically dig out some new protein, you find some new protein implied in some disease or something, and you want to find out what is known about that protein, so you compare that protein against the database. Okay, so databases grow, they double every two years uh, over this period of time, but it continues, it's just an old slide. Uh, actually, it's now 111 million, so uh, no, it's not quite right. Uh, ah, that's because in between your Uniprot dipped. Um, but anyway, so the crucial thing that I want to make here is the number of comparisons is much, much, growing much faster. So that is going by 20-fold over two years in this period here. Uh, and that ultimately means the problem of the square of the speed of the time you take for dynamic programming is becoming worse and worse and worse and worse. The more the databases grow away from computers, because computers grow less than this, so they grow less than our databases. But since we need 20 times, and not two times, more than 20 times, this is way away from the computer. So every year, what we cannot do on a computer in terms of dynamic programming is less than what we could do last year. Uh, and that becomes really a crucial issue. By the way, there's another issue here. Uh, how to choose the best parameters, uh, gap penalty, how to choose the best matrix. Uh, typically, this is only f the answer to this is only for, for people who uh, do more details. I will get a little bit back to that, but that is the way where I leave it today. The major question really is, how can I speed up? So dynamic programming is accurate, it's good gives the optimal solution, given an objective function, but it's too slow. What can I do? How can I speed it up? Yeah? Safe alignment scores for already computed alignments? Yes, so, but that actually, so, um, that's an interesting idea. In fact, in the, in the past, so I started in this field <laughs> Uh, more than two years ago, um, more than 25 years ago. That's when this sort of thing worked. Okay. Uh, today we can actually not do that anymore. So even that doesn't work anymore. There is in fact, uh, there's nobody who can do an all against all 111 million uh, in dynamic programming at this point. So no, we need, we need something else. We need something hashing fast and dirty. And what's the idea behind that? So this slide is not answering your question, but make it get you, maybe you have heard hashing in the context of alignments, uh, not dirty, but hashing, uh, maybe that gets you in the right way of thinking. So how could you do it? Ultimately the answer is you break the problem into smaller pieces. And the first way of doing that is you begin by words. Here shown words of three. So you say, first I'm going to scan through my first sequence and find all the words of three and see where I match a word of three, three in the sequence I align to. And match means identical word. Okay? In this particular case, in the simplest. Uh, so this is, uh, so what I'm talking about is the method BLAST and in the later versions this is sort of replaced by something else and uh, then you sort of put things into a hash and you sort of have a lookup problem. But ultimately the way to understand it, ultimately you have a word match. In this particular case you have five, in this particular example here, you have five initial matches and then in the next step what you do is you extend the initial match. How do you extend? You run a dynamic programming. But why do you gain if you go back again to the dynamic programming? Why did I bring up this word blah blah if at the end of the day I say dynamic programming again? Any idea? Yeah? So you don't find the seeds, you just skip the line? Yes. That is, that is, that is a... <laughs> yes, that is actually, that's an important story. It's, it's, it, yes. It was not exactly the answer I was, war, war, was, was uh, hunting for, but it's absolutely true what you say. There's nothing wrong. And this is in fact one way uh, in which when you come with a new sequence, most of the 111 million will not match and you will throw them away very quickly. And totally right. 
Well, there's something else that I'm, I'm aiming at here. So in those cases, you would actually not ha run a dynamic programming. You don't have the seed, you don't run dynamic programming, so uh, there you don't have an issue with dynamic programming anymore. Ultimately, if you logically think your answer through, you say, uh, in this case, dynamic programming doesn't hurt me because I don't use it. Sure. But I'm, I'm asking you, how come dynamic programming no longer hurts me here in terms of time, although I actually use it? Because the search space is much smaller. The dynamic programming is in the square of the length. If in this particular example, I have, I have uh, five words. But imagine I had only one word in the middle somewhere. So then I sort of, by one word, half the problem, one half times half is a fourth. So I speed up by a factor of four. By finding one single word somewhere in the middle. By finding the five words, I, I split it down by much, much more. And that ultimately is squaring the effect. That, that is in fact where the, the square thing works totally for me. The problem is in the length, and this one breaks down the length very efficiently. Okay, this is as simple as it is. There is some issue here. Uh, the issue: What do I do if my my extension of the dynamic program stops? So here, wh why do I stop? Because the Smith-Waterman score that I showed you before it becomes negative, or it falls below some threshold that I define. It becomes such that I don't want to extend. And if I, if I don't extend, then ultimately I end up with two, uh, three, in this particular case here, three fragments that I aligned. And I do not quite know whether there is an alignment in between. I just didn't find it. Or whether in between you have different domains or insertions, long gaps. Well, what is it in between? Uh, and every day when you run a Psi Blast or Blast, this problem arises. Blast is simply not answering that. Blast is simply doing the statistics and not giving you the answer on that, not answering, well, here this is a domain, or yes, there's an insertion, or yes or no. It's giving you the parts that match end. Okay? Uh, the minds behind the hashing, ultimately the original idea came from uh, William Pearson uh, with David Lipman shown here uh, on the paper in a method that is called was is called still called fast a you may have seen this best in there's a fast a format uh, but it started from here it was essentially uh, bill pearson's idea uh, then he went to this blast here and you may notice that there in fact is an overlap of names here david lipman um, NCBI director, by the way, since many years. Uh, the main person behind it is here in the background, uh, Stephen Altschul. Uh, by the way, Gene Myers went on to assemble the human genome, or to give us grep. It's another thing Gene Myers did. Uh, and he's currently working on, on imaging uh, uh, cells and organisms. And it's actually at the Max Planck Institute in, in Dresden. Um, these people still work on further generations of BLAST and PSI BLAST. Uh, again, it's a fast matching uh, and a dynamic programming extension. The crucial thing about BLAST and PSI BLAST and about any of these uh, word matching is that you have to get the statistics right. So you may ask the question, my first word that I begin with, how long is that word? And very early on, it was clear that it cannot be two. Because two, for two residues, you would fi find random hit, hits. So the, if the seeds are random, you get into trouble. You have to have a length of the word that is long enough, such that the seed, if you begin an alignment, this is what you're starting with is not nonsense. Okay? You're not aligning things that are not related. So you have to somehow look at the background. And ultimately, Fast A did the background probability much better than Blast, but it was so slow was that you actually people, be, instead of you running a fast A, often simply took the dynamic programming. The blast sped up the problem so fast that it, the mistakes were acceptable because in the background of it you could then do the dynamic programming. Now, the way of computing the background is essentially you compute the score. So what I show here is, for instance, the Smith-Waterman score, where you sum over the blossom matrix minus the gap penalties. 
and then you have a background distribution in blue, and then you have a particular hit. And the degree to which this hit is meaningful has to do with how far the red here is from the blue distribution. The numbers that come into the game here essentially is the width of the blue distribution, the average, and the distance to the average of the red, right? And that gives you the expectation value. Okay, um, and I already said that, so essentially the way the statistics are done are different between fast A and blast. The idea in fast A was doing permutations of the two, two sequences that you compare, while blast essentially pre-compiled a probability of the background distribution for the amino acid sequence. So in the, if you run BLAST, it will essentially compute this function here merely based on the amino acid composition of the database. And for any sequence in that database, so if you shuffle the sequences in the database, it will always give the same distribution. While fast A will really do the shuffling itself. And that is more accurate. The BLAST is simpler, but it's also much, much, much faster, as you can easily appreciate. So how accurate are pairwise alignments? Uh, a few things, a few questions. So let's begin with, a, with a, not the, the answer to the question how similar are sequence alignments, but in terms of, of structure. If you have two proteins of similar sequence, do they have similar function? Yes or no or not? I mean, you have three choices. 